All right, I think we'll get started here tonight. Um, thank you for coming out. This is a wonderful turnout on such a cold night. So um, my name is Sadie Urban. I'm the events coordinator here at the Reserve. And this talk tonight is part of a year-long lecture series called Driftless Dialogue. And it's funded in part by the Kickapoo Reforestation Fund, also known as the Newsom Grant, and also the Friends of the KVR. So this evening, we have a panel of members from the Cheyenne Valley Heritage Association. And I'm going to hand um, the microphone over to Diane Revels, who is the president of that association. And the panel will introduce themselves. So I'm also going to pass around a sign-in sheet. Please sign in. Um, it's, I use it for reporting um, for our grant. So I appreciate it. And I'll hand it over to Kevin Alderson. Hello. I mean, you know that? Try can, uh, I have a coach's voice, so can you hear all right without the microphone? If it gets too loud, let me know. Not loud enough, all the field, whatever in between, that's all good. We are extremely gratified to see this uh, turnout. Uh, it's something that deserves tremendous amount of interest, and obviously it's out there because the folks all showed up uh, on this nice, warm evening. So, anyhow, uh, just a little bit about myself because this real story is the folks that are sitting up here on the panel and I kind of like uh, ended up being sort of a narrator and maybe some background information about everything. How my wife Patsy and I, Patsy where are you? Raise your hand please. How, how we first became involved really with Cheyenne Chi Valley Heritage Association is Patsy's an artist and so maybe some of you have seen this book, it's called Barnes Without Corners. And she had painted each of the remaining round barns in Vernon County, of which we still have the most of any place in the nation. We still have 10. At one time, there were as many as 30 or so. So we're doing, uh, since I'm a retired history teacher, uh, from the large originally, but taught up in Cashton for years, then we put this idea together of me, as, long, uh, as well as what the Vernon County Historical Society had already done on barns, uh, to write the history of each barn, and Patsy had painted each of the barns, and then we essentially put this together into this book that we did bring tonight to sale on behalf, in this case, of the Vernon County Historical Society, so they're up here. But uh, part of the story is uh, Algie Shivers, because Algie Shivers, who was the builder of the round barns, there were other builders for sure, but he was the most famous <laughs> round barn builder here in Vernon County, he and his crew probably built as many as 15. And so our research intersected with Algie Shivers, who is a very important part, but only a part, of the tremendous story of Cheyenne Valley, or Peaceful Valley, or Hopeful Valley, or whatever else you want to call it, Rebels Valley, of course. And so uh, that brought us to these folks who then allowed us to make a presentation of the Round Barn book at the Cheyenne Valley Heritage Association picnic or reunion that was every year, then every two years, and I think there's thought about every year, but I'll let those folks talk about that. And so that is essentially how we became members of the Cheyenne Valley Heritage Association. I will say proud members also. And as we began to do more and more research, it's interesting because uh, the Cheyenne Valley is, is uh, located in the town of Forest, for at least the most part. And uh, my father grew up in the town of Forest, and they're going to be talking a lot about uh, Micaiah Rebels, who was a very key figure to this entire story. And at one time, my great-grandfather, who was uh, from out east, actually owned land that cornered on Micaiah Rebels. So the more that we started to get into this personally, the more interesting it became for us personally as well as for everybody else. So these folks allowed us to join, <laughs> as long as we paid our dues. <laughs> and uh, I tell you what, it's a tremendous organization. And I guess I'm going to say this, uh, if it's okay, Diane, although maybe I'm stealing some thunder, okay. is it's made up of a, a, a lot of the original descendants of the folks that settled the valley but it is also open to anybody that has an interest in the organization. And I would uh, absolutely love to see some of you folks join the organization because it is so worthwhile in terms of telling this unique story of Cheyenne Valley. So that's a little bit about me. Didn't say much about Patsy. You want more there, Patsy? 
I'm Diane Revels, and I live in Cheyenne Valley. Uh, my husband and I were married in 1965, and we bought the farm, which I said I was never going to marry a farmer, but oh well. <laughs> so anyway, my uh, great-grandfather was Henry Revels, and his he was the son of Micaiah Revels. And also my husband, his great-grandfather was Henry Revels, so we're, we were third cousins, so just to let you know that anyway. So anyway, we started this uh, organization in 2001, and, which is quite a few years ago, and we've really been busy doing different, uh, different things. So we have, uh, we have uh, uh, bake sales for fundraisers, and we have... Uh, auctions and silent auctions and we have a, a reunion every other year at down at the uh, fireman's park in Hillsboro. we have our own park but we found later that after we had a few down there that it was easier just to have it at the fireman's park and because of, because of the room and the different facilities and stuff was easier for us to have it there so um I'll introduce you to Barb Stanick. Um, my name's Barb Stanick. Um, I am a descendant of Micaiah and Morning Rebels. And um, on my mother's side, her mother and her father were both descendants. And um, I'll, first, I'll tell you a little bit about our Cheyenne Settlers Heritage Society, which was started in the early 2000s. Um, we had a very interested uh, city administrator at that time. His name was Ed Emerson. He heard the story of the Cheyenne Valley and took it upon himself to um, get, get more information and he talked the uh, city into donating a park, and he started the ball rolling, got a hold of uh, my mother and several other uh, descendants, and we started, uh, the interest started in the late 90s actually, but our first reunion was in the early 2000s, and our first, our first reunion uh, brought in upwards of between two and three hundred people, and we uh, we have we have displays, uh, many many family displays, uh, lots of pictures. People um, was very gracious and and brought pictures, and we have them posted at our reunions. Um, it, it is held every other year, and some years we ha we've always had upwards of over a hundred. And some years, like I said, it's between two and three. Uh, we have speakers. We've had uh, uh, speakers uh, about Native Americans and many different things. Very, very interesting. Civil War, This, especially this last year, we had uh, a speaker on uh, the descendants or some of the, um, the valley, the valley uh, men who served in the Civil War. Um, See, we meet we meet quarterly, and on the off years of our reunion, we hold fundraisers. Um, let's see, anything else on the reunion? Our in it, I don't. The park is located on the outskirts of Hillsboro, um, across from the the lake, and uh, our goal um, was to build a gazebo. Hopefully one that we can enclose and um, have pictures and artifacts and things like that. There's many interesting artifacts out there and some great pictures. 
Um, let's see what otherwise. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, my involvement as far as my ancestors. Uh, this is my brother Mike uh, Thompson, and we were we were raised by Algie Shivers and Flory. They uh, also raised my mother and her brother, and they also raised her mother. And Algie and Grandma, we called her little Grandma, um, had no children of their own, but they took in and helped raise many children. Um, we spend a lot of time down there on their farm. Um, it's sad, but the, the buildings are all gone. The only thing left is part of an old pine tree that is 100 plus years old. Uh, it used to have a big old tire swing on it. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, I'll, I'll let Mike talk a little bit here about some of the, the historical dates and things. Hello, um, my name is Mike Thompson, Bars my sister. Uh, I, to me, the biggest or one of the biggest things is that we believe that they had the earliest uh, integrated schools, churches, and athletics uh, uh, in the nation. And this occurred roughly in the middle to late 50s and um, into the 60s. Uh, there were many, many uh, people that were involved in the Civil War from the Valley or later on moved into the valley that were part of it. Um, part of the uh, company or, or part of the people that were involved in the Civil War served at Gettysburg uh, where the, the war turned for the north and, and basically started the downfall of the south. Um, as Barb was saying, we Spent a lot of time on Elgie's farm growing up. Uh, he taught me how to drive tractor at six, and I thought that was the biggest thing there was at that time. Until next year when my sister Patty turned six and she got to drive, and I didn't think it was so much fun because I had to <laughs> load hay off the and load the wagons and stuff, and then and the year after that, Barb got to drive. So <laughs> Patty didn't think it was so much fun, but it learned many LG was uh, had a lot of interest. Uh, he was one of the first people in the area that did custom work and had tractors, and uh, he anywhere from shearing sheep uh, uh, to his, his carpenter work, his, his barn building and stuff. Um, uh, I still many people stop me today and, and talk about LG about his attitude and. He always had a smile on his face. Uh, uh, when you're young, you don't realize uh, what an intelligent man he was as far as uh, he uh, graduated from college uh, and ag engineering college, I believe it was, in, in Missouri. And um, he designed a pump that uh, the University of Wisconsin used, uh, it was uh, on the order of a spring pump, I think, that pumped the water uh, across the road and then um, into it, the holding tanks there. Um, just, you never knew who was going to be down there. I mean, he had visitors from, it seemed like, all over the country, from Chicago, from out east, uh, um, and the cooking. Uh, <laughs> Grandma, and both Grandma and LG cooked, and they had a, there was always something good to eat. Um, and, but he taught, they also taught us as far as, I, I know I was five years old when I started mowing lawn with the push mower and stuff, and uh, helping in the barn. Uh, I got to milk my first cow when I was six years old. He had the old surge boxes with the straps, and he said, be careful because they kick sometimes. And I hung the milker, got it on, and, and adjusted the strap. And the next thing I knew, I was in the gutter, and the milker bucket was on top of me. 
and I thought LG was going to have a heart attack. He was laughing so hard. And I didn't think it was real funny then, but once I got out of the gutter and got cleaned up, and then it was a little... Um, well, I'll let somebody else talk for a while. Um, some of you might be thinking, you know, we want to open this up to all kinds of questions here eventually, but uh, some of you might be thinking, how did this all, in a sense, start in the first place? And uh, through the research that I've found in various kinds of books, including a person who wrote a book called uh, Southern Seed, Northern Soil, whose name is uh, Stephen Vincent, who actually spoke at one of the reunions, uh, what really happens is it's fascinating is if you start with the Indian Removal Act of 1830, if you've heard about that, uh, by primarily relocating the five civilized tribes, you end up mostly then with Cherokee, Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Seminole. Uh, those folks were supposed to be removed to west of the Mississippi because gold had been discovered, believe it or not, in Georgia in 1829 on reservation land. And also, because it was like 25 million acres of land that uh, Southerners wanted to open for cotton planting. And also because it was such a haven for African Americans to flee to because they would escape slavery and come to the reservation where oftentimes Native Americans were extremely good about taking those folks into the tribe. That's why there's actually a uh, book that I like to use too, although it's not a real in real thick book, but it's a history of black Indians. Because something we have a tendency to not know about is the huge numbers of African Americans that were brought into the tribes, partly related to looking for a place to flee to, and also because of the decimation of the numbers of Native Americans through smallpox and so forth. And so you end up with tremendous numbers of Native Americans that also had African American mix and or truly African Americans who were raised in Native American way. So, when you end up with the Indian Removal Act in 1830, the Cherokees term came in 1838, they essentially end up with 17,000 Cherokee there that were forced to go to the new reservation west of the Mississippi and Oklahoma. Along the way, 4,000 died, and that of course is the infamous story of the Trail of Tears. Now, Micaiah is fascinating to me, and not all of this is written down, say, in the history, but my suspicion is, he, he being a very bright guy, he knew these forces were happening, and he essentially stayed one step ahead of that. And so, he voluntarily left North Carolina, Georgia area, in about 1832-1833, and moved on out to Indiana. Because in Indiana, Ohio, and Illinois, the Northwest Territory, from day one, we never had slavery. I can't say there were never slaves at all held within the area, even Perry Sheen had some down at Fort Crawford, but we never had slavery, so it was a haven to flee to. But, how do we get to Cheyenne Valley then? As they leave and get to Indiana and Ohio and Illinois and establish settlements down there, they are somewhat safe from this Native American Removal Act, but then when you run into 1850, I'm not supposed to quiz anybody on this. In 1850 comes the Fugitive Slave Law. And the Fugitive Slave Law essentially enabled Southerners to cross over into Union territory and in fact forced Union police people to arrest and capture runaways and force them back into the South. So uh, even though many of these folks were Native American, unfortunately what's caused so much being mixed up is they simply were all labeled people of color. Then they saw no distinction between Native American, partial Native American, African, or all African. So they were in trouble down there in southern Indiana. They began to take more and more rights away from those folks and more and more pressure was put on them to get to a farther area which was more free. That being, then, it turns out to be an offshoot of the Robertson Beach settlements in Indiana eventually were the founders of Cheyenne Valley, which basically is in the person of Makaja Rebels. Because he had been down there, and he headed up here, 1854. And so those are kind of the national forces. When you think about, you think about the history that's over there with the Indian Removal Act, 
the Fugitive Slave Law, these folks looking for freedom, it is the, one of the most, if not the most important historic site, arguably, in Vernon County. And, and I'm just, it's just fascinating. And the story just goes on and on and on, but I don't know if you want to add more or open the questions or how you'd like to go. Open questions, I think. So anybody have any questions about uh, some of the early pioneers or some of life in the valley or anything like that? Just a simple one. How, how does Cheyenne Valley get its name? <laughs> we do not know that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't know. We don't know. We, I, I'm thinking that about 1930, somewhere in there, it was started to call Cheyenne Valley because before that it was Rebels Valley or Hopeful Valley. So we don't really, we don't really know. And, and what's interesting is, as I've looked at it, is... Uh, it has nothing to do with Cheyenne. Yeah. Valley. Because <laughs> if anything, there are Cherokee or another kind of a branch called the Lumbee. And uh, so Cheyenne, Cheyenne Native Americans had nothing to do with the valley, and yet that's what it's called. And it really was known primarily as Rebels Valley. Even the church there was Rebels Valley Church. Because Micaiah at one time had, what, 140 descendants that all lived in the valley? Yeah. And so um, that was really basically what it was called. Well, he had uh, pretty numbers of children, Micaiah. The, uh, him. Oh, what, 17? 17, I think. Yeah, yeah. And they all uh, did what the Bible said and went forth and multiplied also. And, yeah, and they weren't, there weren't any twins. Well, there was a set of twins, but that was the last set. Where, what's the boundaries of the valley? Where, where, where is it? it? It starts at Burr Ridge. Up by uh, um, Burridge, where um, I know that is. okay, to uh, Wildcat Mountain. Okay. The base of base of the, Wildcat. The base of Wildcat Mountain. Right, east to west. Mm -hmm. There's nowhere B and 33 meet up there. Yeah. Yeah. That was called Barton's Point mm -hmm. after Wesley Barton, who was an African American settler, who was also the postmaster. When you think about, it, as Mike was saying, early integration, uh, how how many postmasters were African American back in 1854? And uh, that was named basically for Wesley Barton, and it was called Barton's Corners, eventually it became Burr Ridge, mm -hmm. and that's kind of where it starts, and it goes all the way down to that. And where was the uh, original homestead? It's on uh, 33, on Highway 33, uh, about halfway between Burr Ridge and Wildcat. There's a home there now. There's a uh, cemetery there. The Rebel Cemetery is there, and it was just, just, uh, just a short ways from that cemetery. I guess I, I can handle the questions. Yes. Sure. <laughs> how, how did the group originally move in there? And that's a multi-part question. Why did they go there? And how did they acquire the land? Was it homesteading? Was it some kind of homesteading? Okay, so question being, how large of a group and why there? Right, and how they acquire the land? I mean, they actually take ownership. <coughs> thirteen original. Yeah. The originally there was thirteen original families that uh, kind of grouped together when they came out, led by McKagey. I think he was out uh, two or three years before and did the original filings on the homestead and stuff. Um, some of these people were already at that time related by marriage. Uh, the Roberts family, Waldron, uh, of course the Rebels, uh, 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 Arms, uh, Shivers came a, a little later, but uh, uh, they, they weren't too far behind. Uh, uh, just Winchell's, uh, I could never remember all as far as that goes. Uh, um, I was with the question was asked before about how Cheyenne Valley got its name. My grandma, Flora, used to say that Brebbles Valley was the main part of the valley down 33, and just as you get to the bottom of the hill from Burr Ridge, about where the post office was in there, that little valley that shoots to the left was called Cheyenne Valley. And she always said that's where the roughnecks lived up in that area. And, stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and somehow over the years, uh, it just, the whole valley got the Cheyenne. So. Just to add to that, that would be uh, today's Town Hall Road. Yes. Mm 
So That's correct. Right. Driving that way, Town Hall Road was actually Cheyenne Valley, and the main valley there in 33 was Revelsville. Yes. So was there a town? Actually, it was like a town. It was like a town. They had their own uh, school. They had their own church. They had their own store. They had a uh, post, post office. office. They yeah. had their uh, like a hoop uh, where they made hoop for. Uh, sawmill. Sawmill. Yeah, it was a hoop making uh, barrel factory. Uh, as you come down 33, uh, just within less than a quarter mile from where the Rebels Valley Cemetery is now. Rebels Valley. Valley yes. Yeah. But it wasn't far from it. Because right. yeah. if you take the algae's place, that's just a few miles farther up the road. Okay. And then also East Eastman Lane, where one of the integrated schools, Eastman School, was also just up the road from Valley. And so uh, I know uh, algae and Otis and those folks spent a lot of time in Valley. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> where was algae's place? Yeah. Uh, those folks grew up on it, so I'll have them in. What's that? Why don't you want to know where Algie's place is? Algie's uh, farm is on County P. Um, there's there's nothing left. The, the bottom wall of the round barn can be seen in the spring when there's no growth there. But uh, he had two driveways, and uh, one came down by the house and one came down by the barn. And he had, there was at one time a full set of buildings. Yeah, there's, you can see the house foundations there when the growth is done. Where, where on P? Um, P comes off of 80, is it? And it goes up over a hill. It's about a, roughly a mile. You come over the hill and start down the hill. And it's roughly two miles maybe from where P comes off of 80. Uh, it'd be on the left hand side if you're going to her towards Valley. 82. 82, whatever the road that goes down the far. Yeah. I I mixed them up all my life, I guess. <laughs> but yes, yeah. And, and actually, uh, the cover of the book is a picture of Algie's barn that the family went to us from Patsy to paint from. And then uh, the house is in the background, and the giant pine tree she was talking about is on there. Uh, Patsy moved the mailbox. That's one of the things about artists, they can do things like that. <laughs> because it obviously wouldn't have been down by the barn, but because she wanted to get the name Shivers so you could see it, then she moved the mailbox out. Yeah, it was right by the driveway as you go down by the house with the mailbox. So Shivers, Shivers was involved with brown barns as well as Riddles? Um, LG and his brothers, uh, like, built what we believe the majority of the round barns in Vernon County, but um, I'm not going to say, and there probably was Rebels that worked on his crew. I, as far as I know, there was anywhere from five to ten different people that worked with the Shivers Brothers building the, the barns, and they built conventional barns too, but of course they're more known for... Round, round barns were in season for a while, and then they went to... Well, uh, the University of Wisconsin at the time had thought, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, that it was just a more efficient uh, way of doing your work and stuff because the cows usually faced in and you fed them in one place instead of the, row, uh, the rows that were the two rows that faced out or uh, out to the barn walls. and. It, it was supposed to cut down the amount of steps as far as feeding, and uh, you started in one and went right down one row to milk. And you see the silo was in the center. Yeah, and the silo was in the center. And um, I have a picture of one of the rectangular barns that LG built. It was um, in the in the valley between Mount Tabor and Ontario. Um, trying to think of the name, it's a... Uh, Johnny Cave? Just before Johnny Cave. Okay. Uh, 
I think it was the fish. Mm -hmm. It was no, it wasn't fish. Mm -hmm. I can't. I can't think of fish it right now. Well, it's the Echo Valley's of Johnny Cake. Yeah. It's a little west of that yet. The barn's no longer there. Um, the picture I have is, it actually has algae and, oh, about six or seven other men standing there uh, in the, during the building process. Get back towards Wenishes and where DeWitt lives. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that does get missed is because algae is so yeah. famous now for his round barns, he built, he built a lot of buildings. It's just that the round barns get emphasized, and once the round barns were no longer seen as being efficient, then he converted over to building other barns. There's, there's a round barn on Lower Ridge Road, just above Ontario, southwest of Ontario. Is that one of the fish? Yeah. yeah fish. They call it yes. the fish. was pretty much specific to Vernon County and Monroe. And in Monroe. There's yeah. a few on there. Did the Quakers have an influence on Shire community? <coughs> I'm, I'm gonna they, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well I was just gonna say that that's they uh, one time they felt that that's how some of these families, some of their relatives were passed through by the Quakers uh, at Belton. And in Cheyenne Valley itself, it, it was rumored that they were stops on the Underground Railroad as they passed the escaped slaves through to Canada. It, it is true that uh, the settlements in Indiana, Illinois, and Ohio often were settled near Quaker settlements. And since Belton has a Quaker settlement, then that is certainly speculated and likely to be true. And then the other thing I thought that was interesting is uh, there's a very early history of the Wesleyan Methodist Church also up there in uh, Burr Ridge. And the Wesleyan Methodist Church were extremely strong abolitionists from day one, as were the Free Methodists, which basically gets their word for, uh, name for two things. One is you didn't have to pay to set the pew, like you did there for a while with the Methodists, as I've been told. And then secondly, they believed in freedom, and that's how they split from the Methodists, because you still have the Methodist folks, although I was raised Methodist, Southern Methodists, and then you have the Free Methodists, who one of these splits was over the issue of slavery. And since the, the Cheyenne Valley, originally, because Micaiah was also a preacher, Methodist, right? was a he was an ordained yeah. Methodist minister yeah. on top of everything else. And eventually, that church, the old log church, apparently eventually burned down, and then the church that most folks know about the foundation was a free Methodist church of which our free Methodist, uh, Methodist minister, Mark Phillips, sent me up a packet of the history of that church with who all the ministers have been and all that, a picture of which I would have to show to you later. So it's all this story just keeps on folding. It, it's, um, I don't know where it's going to Well, I don't know if it ever is, and I hope it doesn't. There's and many, actually, many his son... Uh, um, his son was a minister too, uh, John Wesley. He's also a yes. minister. So after, after the 13 families settled, um, did work get back to Indiana and Ohio? And some some of them come? did go back. Some did go back. Did more people come? They from? they yes. came. Uh, Micaiah came up first, and then he sent uh, he sent for his family, his wife and ch children. And then, and then eventually the ones that were already, they were already, some of his children were already married and had families, and then they eventually, they came up to the, they came up and joined the Valley too. So. Yes? Um, when I taught in Hillsboro, we did some um, family research, and one of the Rebels boys brought an amazing family history. And you start with, with my my kata. And it had been written and looked like a long time ago. And it was just fascinating. I didn't have a chance to read it all the way through. Do you still have that? Does someone have that fascinating book? It's not a book, but this is Epi. Are Delaney. you talking about the diary that uh, Micaiah's youngest daughter wrote? My son did a uh, did a thing, history thing when he was in high school. Uh, Rory? Yeah. Rex. Rex. 
Okay. Well, I think all of all three of my kids. Have, all three of my kids. Vanessa, have done that. Yeah. I had and Renisa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Renisa. Those are my well, children. Well, it was fascinating. I thought, well, I hope they don't lose that. No, well, yes. yes. Now it mentioned uh, Morning Star. Morning. <coughs> Well, she she, she was a Jacobs. Her her maiden name was Jacobs, but she also uh, was from Georgia, and uh, they married young. Uh, I think Mackay was 20, 20, and I think she was like 16, yeah. something like that. Well, it's a fascinating book, and I'm glad it hasn't been lost. <laughs> in fact, there's a now that's on hand at the Historical Society in Madison. And I was able to like to get a copy of it, and as you said, it is absolutely fascinating because it's uh, Micaiah's youngest daughter, I think. Yeah. Yes. Her diary of what Micaiah had said about what it was like when they first came to the town of Forest and the bears and the wolves and all the stuff that was there. And as Mike said before this, or someone did about the cemetery, the Rebel Cemetery, the Rebel Cemetery is essentially located right where he first camped that first year that he was up here before he sent for the rest of his family. And so it's um, another great story. Yeah. Um, when was the round barn um, cleaned out or deconstructed? <coughs> that would be closest uh, to Valley or Cheyenne Valley. When, when was the, it was last there? When was it that was last there? That would have been the Manson barn up Fish Hollow. Yeah. Uh, and that was about four years ago. That it fell down. It fell down. Yeah. 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 We tried at one time to get that moved in the hill. Was there any open by Warner Creek? Was there ever a round line there? Well, so I think the Fish Hollow <laughs> barn that talked about Manser and Manshine, yeah. that's yeah. what yeah. currently on. That was often known as the Warner Creek and yeah. round yeah. barn. Okay. And Tom, uh, Tom Shivers owned that property for a while. Oh, did he? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Brother. I got to tell you a story about one of the round barns. I worked with this uh, <coughs> this gal that uh, at my, I work at Land's End, and I worked with this gal that had uh, there's two round barns on the farm over by Tripville, and she was telling me her husband was a truck driver and he was gone all the time, and she was she had two kids to home, and she said she kept telling the kids she said we should get those horses out of that barn because they had the horses in the barn because she said it really was getting in bad shape. So she was telling me this, and she said, so a couple of days later, she said, I, I know i got to get those kids to help me get those horses out of the barn. So a couple of days went by, and she said, Diane, remember when I was telling you about that, you know, get, we got, I finally talked the kids into getting the horses out of there, and she said, I got home, she said, I was washing dishes, and she said, I heard the funniest noise. And she said, it sounds like when you take pencils and you break them, and, and she said, I looked out the window, and that round barn went down. Yeah, that was the, the, the Dank barn, yeah, right? Dank <coughs> barn. Well, yeah, the Dank Barn. Well, isn't the Dank Barn the one? But there's another one. Yeah, yeah. There's Beyond the that. Yeah, that, that was the first one that went, went down. down. Yeah, the Dank mm -hmm. Barn was the second yeah. one. I can't think of the man. Yeah. Kind, of, yeah. kind of funny, too, just the story, to for some humor, I guess, in addition to everything. But we mentioned the, the barn up on Lower Ridge Road. When we, when we did the book, we called it the Fish Barn because it was owned by John and Gail Fish. And we were taking some folks on a tour and talking about uh, both Amish and Round Barns and so on. And we talked to these people, no shot now in the big city, anybody's here from the big city. But we said, Patsy, I think, said something about, yeah, this is the Fish Barn. And they looked at it and they said, how do you raise fish in there? <laughs> so we had to start calling it the Lower Ridge Barn. <laughs> yes. The fish barn. Fish barn. Uh, that um, is there a Donahue or something like that from up in Ontario. It was built for them, but algae built it. And so a lot of times you end up with a situation too where the owner of the barn didn't build the barn, and so you'll know it by a name differently than algae's because they're the owner and he was the builder. And then algae also, um, if he didn't build it, there were a lot of times he went and laid it out and then kind of got it going, and then the farmers would come in and with whoever else finish, finish it. So algae build that spring? They make that ram on that spring, or do you buy that? Well, I understand what he designed it in uh, the University of Wisconsin. But he left a ram on that spring in his place. 
that's what I, yeah. my understanding was, but uh, that he designed it and they came and made blueprints of it and marketed it through the University of Wisconsin. But what was that question? <clears throat> the ram on the pump for the spring. Water well, ram. That's what I was talking about. Yeah. If I understood it correctly. It uses the pressure, downhill pressure of the spring to pump it up the Right. Why? I'd like to make a comment about, uh, <coughs> I learned a lot about the families from the 1930 census, which I know you all have. <laughs> My grandmother did that census. Oh. Yeah. And <laughs> she told me story after story that all the families and all the intermarriages. And uh, about once a year, I dig that out and go through. And you, found out, and you found out you were related. No. <laughs> <laughs> she got me. <laughs> well, it wasn't in there. <laughs> so, something really interesting, too, in that. Yeah. Census. Amy Lund uh, yeah. is our uh, social studies teacher down in Lafarge, and she did a in my view, a great study on Cheyenne Valley. And she took the census from like 1920, 1900, 1860, and laid it out in terms of who owned what property in, in the sense of white, uh, African American, Native American, and or mix. And a thing that's interesting about the town of Forest too, is it wasn't like there was just a segment that was all African American or Native American. It was all interspersed. I mean, it was never just one little area, it was throughout the township. And uh, as was mentioned about algae, I remember in the book, here, here's a situation where algae and other folks went to integrated school, had an integrated church, had an integrated community, and algae did not face segregation until he went to World War I. And at that point then had to serve in segregated units. And so those folks that sometimes think that us, we out here in the backwoods are backward, <laughs> there are some things they can learn about the people that were here. Otis Arms used to say, over in Cheyenne, everybody was equal. Nobody had nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and to add to the census that Lonnie was talking about, a lot of times, too, your race depended upon the census. They've got guys like Elijah Bass went from Mulatto to Native American. Elizabeth Bass went from mulatto to Native American. Charles Bass went from mulatto to black. You get to some of these, uh, one of the later ones, Herman Arms went from black to white. John Delaney went from black to white. Harrison Rebels went from black to white. It all depends upon what census you look at. And some of these folks, like uh, James Rebels, went from mulatto to black to white. <laughs> and they're all the, same, all the same folks. It's just a different census taker from a different year. So if you're wondering why there's confusion over there, uh, as far as ethnic and racial background, uh, there's good cause for that. I mean, it's, it's very interesting. Somebody asked LG about it once, and uh, about what happened to all the black people who were mixed, and, uh, and he said, well, they just faded away, as far as meaning that they became Americans, and, the distinction wasn't there anymore. Um, they go anywhere. They're sitting here. That's <laughs> here. That's the whole thing. And you know the thing, I, and again, I'm kind of, the thing that I'm, I'm so happy about is, especially when the, movie, the show Roots came out, a lot of people really took an interest in discovering their heritage. And uh, I don't know if even the folks from Cheyenne Valley realize just how, what a valuable heritage how important that heritage is. And it's so I'm just so happy to see the Cheyenne Valley Heritage Association essentially standing up there and say, this is who we are and we're proud of it. Which is a great leap forward. Definitely. Yes? As far as the original core group that settled, um, there's, for me personally, is there like documentation of family to family to bring it up to like current. Is there some place? Family trees. Yeah. Uh, there are. Oh, yeah. We there are books. 
We have, there are books that we have that's um, been published. Ivo Rebels, um, one of Roberts. her daughters. Roberts, Ivo Roberts. Roberts, I mean. Yeah. Um, one of her daughters has a doctorate in, is it history? Yeah. From the uh, University of New Mexico, and they compiled several family trees, uh, and they're available if you need them, and there's Rebels. I'm not sure. There's some websites too. Yeah. Uh, Celine, you might want to mention I'll, some I'll of those. Any one of you would be. Mm -hmm. I would have to. Try to find it or yeah. 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 In fact, the rebels. Yeah. You brought a copy of the rebels book, didn't you? Or is that something Yes, different? I did. I yeah. Did. Celine did. So. Actually, it's. Uh, that's a Roberts book. Oh, right? Roberts book? No, that's Roberts book. No, but there's a Rebels book. Oh, okay. And everything in between. Oh, <laughs> all right. Enter the studio. Roberts is not mentioned it. Rebels and Shivers Connection. Unless I'm mistaken about this, Al Algie's mother was a rebel. Right. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, yes, there's a connection. And, and Otis's was too. Yes. If the church was so important to them in their community, why does that not exist? Other than the foundation today, um, because people moved uh, after the barrel factory uh, lost, it was basically farms, and as the young people grew up, they there, they moved to the cities moved to the to cities get, and get jobs, and pretty soon there was very fewer. And did it just fall down or burn down or? The last one did, I think it just fell because I can, I can remember being up when I was uh, um, uh, six to ten years old. We used to roll, we lived down there, Ma and us uh, used to walk up 33 and push uh, one more up at least and roll a cemetery. cemetery. We did it for several years and then uh, Eddie Wallman's family. Now, yeah, right. now it's Ron and I. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and there's still a Wesley church, it's just up by Earth. Yes. Yep. There's been yes. a couple of new churches built up yes. there. Yeah, and I think some of the folks went to the Wesleyan church in Hillsborough. Yes. And yes. some came down, uh, Kitty Corner from where I grew up, take a Pooch and talk, um, down in Lafarge at the Seventh day Adventist church. And Valley had a church, and Mount Pisgah had a church. Mount Pisgah moved from where it's at Lafarge. Mm -hmm. But Valley. Fifteen years ago, it was still going in that. Oh, yeah. But yeah. it's no longer there either. Yes? Um, where was the original uh, Burridge Church? Wesley Church. Burridge, the Burridge Church, I guess I'd say because my parents got married in the Parsonage. The Burridge Church was pretty much right across from the cemetery, and the Parsonage was there. And then when they built the new one, they moved it down. This is Wesley. Wesleyan. And you asked Wesleyan or yes, Wesleyan. Yeah. Yes, yeah. so right where Fish Hollow Road, Hall. Fish Hollow Road branches off 33, right across was where the church was at. Right. Uh, now are you talking Rebels Valley Church? No, Burr Ridge. Burr Ridge Church. Church. Yeah. Yeah. When I was a, when I was a kid, um, I used to pass the trip that pastor at Wesleyan Church for, for very many years until the last year. Yeah. And we used to go hunting over across there where the church used to be there as well. He used to keep the pastor boy used to keep it <coughs> And I remember, I can remember there were still some pieces of like the steps or something over there. Yeah. there I remember seeing when we used to hunt over there. Yeah. Well, I remember the church for Yes. Yeah. What church was or is or was from the ice cave? You go on that side road, I want to say it's half the Mount Pisgah. Mount Pisgah. So that's Mount Pisgah. Isn't there one farther south? Yeah, that's the new one. Same they, church. It's the same church. They just moved it. In fact, I was married in that Mount Pisgah church, the old one. And where was the old one? It was on County Truck Gap. Yeah, before you start up, they go to up 33 to go up Wildcat Mountain. Mm -hmm. uh, that around. goes to the left and goes there and makes a bend and goes up on the hill. And just before F meets 131 out here, uh, Quarter mile back, maybe, is where it's set on the left hand side of the road. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm really curious because my mother was from a birth. She was a downing from Ontario. And she always told me up to Johnny Cape there was a black church years and years ago. Uh, so would that have been a part? I 
And I'm not exactly sure in Johnny case, you know, there was a church and there was a school, but the, the, the church, what was considered the black church years ago, was in that area. Now, would that have been a part of... Yes, it was. Johnny Cake was. Yes. Okay, because I was always curious there about that because the building department. At gone. least two round barns up there, but I, where I remember the church being in the school, where you come from Ontario, uh, where WD turns into, is it L? What is that? Most of my favorite. Yeah, L. It goes up the hill where Marquis yeah. lives. Echo Valley Farm is right at the bottom of the hill where they put that in now. But Echo Valley is to the left, and just before you make the corner to the right, it goes back to <coughs> where there's a cemetery back there. By Billing Street. Yes, Billing Street. Billing Street. Oh, okay. And just, uh, uh, is it up there that uh, turns and goes down by the park? But right where it turns there, there was a school and school church right there. on one side and a church on and the other. I can remember them both, uh, but they'd probably both been down 20. Well, was it, I, I remember the school and the church both of being a child, but was the church that was there, was that the black church, or was the black church kind of close to that? Um, as far as I know, it was one and the same. Was it the same, one yeah. and the same? As far as I ever knew, yeah. And I believe it was a Methodist church. Yeah, it probably was, yeah. Eugene. Well, thank you. Uh, Will Bass's son, Howard, is still alive. He's 96 or 97. <laughs> He's living down in Deep Green, Arkansas. He's yeah, he's yeah. He's been to the reunions. <coughs> yes. Not the last one. No, I talked to him a couple times. There were also two years. families there uh, Otis Orange and Blanche and Elgin and Flory. Those two families played dominoes back and forth together. Yes. <laughs> we grew up playing dominoes and chickens. You can always find Elgin in the corner there. Or Valley. Or Valley. Or Now my mom, yeah. my mom and I one time went to Hillsboro and we were going to get groceries and she saw Otis and the next thing we knew we, it was in the bar and she was playing the piano and my mom was playing the harmonica and I was doing the singing so <laughs> <laughs> we forgot to get the groceries so we had fun all afternoon. Yes. Um, I just uh, made a copy of this. This is actually the Cheyenne Valley Society newsletter for 2014. I'm just going to pass these around and you can return them but if you'd like to join uh, there's actually a form in here, but this is what Kevin and I use when we give um, tours, and this just gives you an idea because of the fact that there's really not a lot to see, but when we go around, we you know show where these buildings were. So I'm just going to pass these around, and you guys just keep passing them around as you're speaking, and if you have any questions, you can probably start. Then we're also uh, very fortunate. Now, again, the Historical Society, to start, that's some things, too, if you ask later some of the sources where you can find some things down at the Historical Society uh, Kickapoo Valley Association, back in the day, there were uh, there was a, a major grant that was back in, what, the 70s, Lonnie or so, and they were going around doing various kinds of things, of which one of the things was the emergence of the Kickapoo Pearls, if you've seen that magazine. But there were also a number of oral uh, interviews that were done, and this is an interview, actually, of Otis and Blanche Arms, and it's so interesting because they're asking them a lot of these questions, like you're asking these folks, but you're going one or two generations past, yes. and then the other side is all uh, uh, Otis playing uh, piano, and it's so fascinating too because Otis had lost his fingers on one hand, so he's courting with that hand, he's playing everything with the other, and he's playing all kinds of waltzes, yeah, boogie awesome. boogie, you name it, it's all there. So uh, lot, there are there's some good information out there about this subject, but it hasn't necessarily been uh, real well communicated. And so that's another reason why we wanted, wanted to do this tonight. There are several tapes recorded. I, mean, I don't know where they're all at. Some are uh, at the start of the society in Baroka, but there are several down at uh, the start of the society in Madison. Yep. Uh, there's got to be seven to ten different uh, ransom bass, bud bass, uh, flory, uh, rebels. Uh, Jeffrey Rako, our mother, and um, there's several other ones too that uh, I, I don't know the names of. Okay. It kind of, kind of came out of when they just this book called Black Settlers of Wisconsin. It's kind of like there's 
Tens of Wisconsin, Norwegians of Wisconsin, Germans of Wisconsin, someday maybe kick Putin's from Wisconsin. <laughs> but uh, this uh, is really about the settlement down in Grant County and then the settlement in Cheyenne Valley. And a lot of those interviews that he's talked about were done for this book that was turned out in 1977. I got uh, the man who wrote that book, wrote Zachary Cooper. Yep. He wrote in my book, he said, uh, um, a little uh, light. Uh, wording on a dark subject. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> a little light wording on a dark subject. He wrote, that's how he signed my book. So, I have that book. Yes? I, I just wanted to say years ago, my dad used to play pool with Elgie Shivers and Otis Arms down to the Hills Pro Pool Hall. Uh, John and Irma Benish owned it at the time. Anyway, you talk about Otis not having his fingers and stuff. Dad said he was the best pool player ever played against. <laughs> He, he compensated real well. Yeah. <laughs> yes. There's a stream that runs down, it starts up there, well, it starts there up by F, up past where Henry Schmidt owns land, runs down to uh, Cheyenne Valley. I've heard it called like three different, I've heard it called Cheyenne Creek and Wolf Creek and so Does anyone know what it really is? Really Billings, is? I think it's Billings. It is Billings. Yeah, on the Cheyenne Valley. Yeah. 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 Yes. I'm curious, there seems to be a lot of harmony uh, with the ethnic background in the valley. Was that shared throughout the region, or was there uh, more hostile uh, communities in the, in the state? I think, I think they got along, uh, everybody got along, and I think they still do. <laughs> well, this area here, I remember Grandma saying that uh, you, you had to work so hard to survive and feed your families and stuff that... Uh, most of them didn't have time for anything else. And a lot of house parties. Yes. Uh, they worked together. <laughs> music, and if somebody yeah. needed help. Uh, it didn't matter what color you were or what your ethnic heritage was. So and I, I guess I'm curious, because I'm, I'm new to the area, whether that, that army was shared throughout the state. You know, I, mean, I don't think so. No. <laughs> no. No. Milwaukee, they, they had yeah. serious problems in Milwaukee. They but Elgie, Elgie mentioned uh, a few times that uh, if he w if he went somewhere and he sat down, he said he could always kind of tell the feeling of the people that were there, and he said if he um, he got this feeling that maybe he wasn't wanted, he said he'd, he'd just get up and leave, um, and it, that did happen several times. But uh, for the most part, you know, the, the local communities, Hillsboro, Ontario, I mean, he didn't have any problems. Kaz, there was a story told once he was over in Kaz, and uh, he knew a couple people in there, and he uh, went up to the bar and got something to drink, and uh, started playing dominoes or something with some of the local people. And there were some people from out of town in there, um, several of them, and they come over and basically told him, he wasn't welcome there. He, he needed to get out, you know, go to a bar where his own color was. And, um, there were several big, tall, Bohemian heritage people, <laughs> uh, farmers that knew LGO's life, and they basically told them they needed to leave and then come back, <laughs> which they did yeah. right away. And to add to that, correct me if I'm wrong, Algie could speak Bohemian. Yes, oh, yeah. Elsbo, yeah. Bohemian, yeah. French, yes. because of being in uh, World War One, yes. and um, that was gifted. As was his dad, Thomas yes. Rivers. Yeah. He had an adventure in Chicago, knowing the the Bohemian language from Hillsborough. He was uh, my dad always played cards with Elgie, and he'd come home and tell Elgie stories. Elgie told him this one. Elgie had gone to Chicago on business. He was in the South Side, which at that time were quite a few Bohemians. And Algie thought, well, he'd go in the local tavern and have a drink or so. And he walked in, well, it was all whites, of course. And they turned around, they stared at him. And he said they started to talk about him in Czech. And what they said wasn't all that complimentary. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> so he said, well, I walked up to him. And he said, in Czech, he said to them, well, I may be black, but I'll show you my heart is white, and I'll buy, uh, buy you guys some drink. And he said, they turned around, they ran off the phone. <laughs> 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 I didn't expect him to know Jeff. <laughs> yep. um, it's, it's wonderful to hear about the harmony that has 
uh, existed between the ethnic groups. Was there a Ku Klux Klan organization in Valley? What's that? I have heard that. Have, have heard that? Sorry to, sorry to say, excellent study, but um, those of us who graduated from Lafarge, one of our history teachers back in the day was Gordon Lee. And Gordon Lee's, uh, as Eugene and I were talking about before this started, Gordon Lee's master's paper was on the KKK of Vernon County. And it was in the 20s. So it existed? Yes. Yes, we have a Shine Valley cookbook. Those are for sale somewhere. I don't know about tonight. 
And uh, a lot of those recipes, a lot of those yeah. recipes go back to you know, Pioneer Day. Yeah. So when's the next reunion? You know? We haven't decided yet. Next <laughs> week. Yeah. It'll be 2014. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to decide if we're if we should have an annual year. or every two years like we did before. Because yes. one year we would have an auction and the next year we would have a, the reunion. The next year we'd have a reunion. I think it's we're doing on the amount of interest that we have a lot of interest. It all depends on you. <laughs> Get a bunch of members out of here, we'll have two a year. No, I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> yes. What's the nationality of the rebels family? Well, we. <laughs> well, I traced it back to 1300 and something. Okay. And, and, what was your and name? then, and that was in England. And it's. Okay. Scotch Irish, I think. Mm -hmm. well, that I book mentions French too. Yeah. 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 We have some French. Welsh yeah. that come out on the Robert yeah. side. Yeah. 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 I think Stephen. Uh, Stephen Rebels was English. Yes. I think his his wife his wife Bulliard or something Bullard. like that was a combination of French yeah. and Portuguese. Actually. Right, Portuguese. Yeah. yeah. And that's been one of the things too. that has been a bone of contention. I don't think anybody's upset about what <coughs> ethnic group they are or race they are. It's just that the U.S. decided that everybody's going to be put together into color, and an awful lot of people lost their true heritage because of lumping everything together. It's not a matter of mm -hmm. Anybody being ashamed of being anything is just uh, just got lost, and uh, it's being rediscovered, which is a good thing. In fact, they're even doing DNA testing and stuff. Yes. You know, I think uh, didn't one of the is it Laura? Laura denial. denial. Just had DNA testing. Just to see. I don't know how that works, but just to see what the basic makeup is within her personality or within her yeah. Yeah. genes. What? Yeah. Yeah. Genes. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. uh, a lot of immigrants come into this country. In, in, but Ingle and I, they made their names English. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's one family that I know in the Viola down here. I said, that last name sounds like it's Irish. She said, yes. She said, my grandfather dropped the O. And I thought that was kind of sad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, and and that happens a lot, yeah. you know. When, when England colonized Ireland, they moved Irish families into England and English families over and the Scottish and the heritage is so mixed up. How could anybody say they were pure or anything? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. It's right. Even the uh, German Nordic, as far as they have so many different combinations of it. One thing we didn't touch upon before, with, which to me was real interest, uh, the KG uh, had, had his sons uh, fought in the Civil War, <coughs> and his, he had several brothers and their nephews that also fought, but they fought for, uh, they so, were part of the Georgia regiments. Yeah. Um, Micaiah had six sons that fought in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. and, and one died. And, and one died in the Civil War. Yeah. And my great grandfather was, he got wounded twice, Henry did. Another uh, really good book to read is uh, one called An Irishman in the Iron Brigade. Mm -hmm. Because it's about Company K of the 6th Wisconsin, and that's the same company that the Rebels boys were in. Yeah. And they are referred to significantly in that book. And um, um, Mickey uh, Sullivan is buried up in Ontario. Where it's basically a, a war hero, that, like we have one also over in, uh, I, I see, is it Liberty? Is that the right place? Liberty Cemetery? No. No, what is it? Uh, retreat. 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 Retreat, yeah, there you go. Yeah, Francis Waller, who won the uh, Medal of Honor at uh, the battle of Gettysburg. Capturing the second Mississippi play. Yes. So. yes. Uh, Edgar Eno, is that name? Mm -hmm. Eno. Does he fit into this story at all? Or? I don't know. Valley. Yeah, yeah, he's over the hill. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Valley, Forest Township. 
like a plaid book. And Jim Greeley from Richard Center did this for me, and he didn't charge me a nickel. Wow. Which is the way which, which gave him the idea. He'd never done this before, so this gave him the idea. Um, what year are those? What year is that one? Okay, that's the oldest one. 1915. You can hold them, uh, uh, Kevin, if you want to hold sure. them up there, and then they could. 1931. Every 15, about every 15 years. Is Mount Tabor figuring with this in anyone? Yeah, it does. That's, that's in there. John Tabor, one of the early settlers, Caucasian. Nathan Sherman, Caucasian. They were all there about the same time as Kayak. So if you know the family names to look for, mm -hmm. uh, you can find where these home places are. And then Vernon County, they don't have, well, they do out there if you go out to the historical society, they have a large map on the wall. But uh, something I found to be useful is this is an 1878 plat book redone, of course, but it's the first plat book that was done in, the state of, in uh, Vernon County. And so this will take you back to that next generation before that as far as some I think this might be a good spot to uh, wrap it up, but maybe the panel, if you have any more specific questions, you could. Uh, I just is there another Algie Shivers in Madison? Yes. Someone found the name and wondered. Yeah. Very Mike curious. Nephew. Oh, nephew. Yeah. Um, it would be Algie's nephew's nephew. Grand, a grand. Nephew. Yes. Yes. Right. I guess I'd like to thank the panel for this. Sherry,